Hello and welcome to the Sunshine Cathedral. The Sunshine Cathedral is a different kind of church where the past is past and the future has infinite possibilities. And with that, we invite you to come and worship with us here on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. at 1480 Southwest 9th Avenue. Now, I invite you to come in and worship with us here at the Sunshine Cathedral. A reading from the wisdom of Frank Richelieu. Jesus taught that we should not put our hand to the plow and look back. What is a plow for? It is for breaking up the old hard ground and preparing it for renewal. If we are trying to plow ahead of us and are looking back over our shoulder, what kind of furrow will we plow? When you are ready to break up the crystallized ideas in your mind and prepare your consciousness for newness, do not look back. Look ahead. Jesus said we cannot expand while looking back and holding on to the old at the same time. We must let go of that which is behind us. We are here to grow and move ahead. In these human words, God's voice is heard. God is with you. And also with you. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you in dwelling Christ. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is the one of my choosing, with whom I am well pleased. This is the gospel, the good news. How many people were here Friday night for the showing of Sorted Lives? Wasn't that fabulous? And what was especially fabulous is when the people who had seen it hundreds of times, apparently, um, would say the lines along with everyone, and especially this really, really funny line, some of which I wouldn't dare say from the pulpit, but was screaming with everyone else on Friday night. And, uh, the, and then the other part that was really amazing were the people who'd seen it the first time and how moved they were by it, sort of tearful at the, at the touching parts and just doubled over laughing, losing, losing bodily control uh, at the funny parts. It was amazing how it became uh, clear to me that this movie has touched our community. It came out of our community, it has touched our community, it has remained important to our community, and even just watching it together has sort of a spiritual and ritualistic sort of impact. How we participated in it together. We came together, almost 50 people, just to share food and share time and share tears and share laughter, and something really amazing and sacred was the result. And that's what is important why we do what we do is to bring people together so that in their togetherness they realize how special they really are and how much reason there is to hope in their lives. Now sometimes when these things happen and they happen organically and naturally those things sort of crystallize and so what becomes sort of an organic sort of tribal ritual then becomes an institutional ritual and we cling to it and it becomes uh, crystallized and concrete and the thing that used to represent joy or hope or healing becomes a thing unto itself and that's when I think that thing starts to get in the way when things point beyond themselves to something greater they are symbols when things point to themselves they are idols and idols get in the way. Well, some of our most treasured and precious traditions and rituals can actually become idols if we're not careful. And when that happens, we need to revisit them and recast them and redefine them so that we can have a new understanding of them so they can point us back in the direction of hope and healing and joy and not to themselves as something that we have to be chained to. Well, the ritual that came, uh, comes out of a particular community and, and then evolves into a particular tradition that we hear about today in that gospel reading is, of course, the ritual of baptism. Jesus, like so many people in antiquity, participates in this cleansing ritual, or so the gospel said. 
In fact, all of the Gospels uh, mention it. They differ greatly about how it happened and about uh, uh, who all was involved. In Mark's version of it, there is no banter between, uh, between Jesus and John. Jesus comes to be baptized, and John says, good to see you, let's get to splashing. It's just that easy. It, there, there, there's no argument about it. Well, 15 years later, when Matthew is writing, Matthew has John being squeamish. Oh, who am I to baptize you? Don't you want to baptize me? Let's, tr let's change roles. I'm really nobody, and Jesus has to insist, no, please, 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 I want to get wet. And so they have this argument about it. When Luke tells his story, he forgets that John may have been part of it at all. Luke just says that, uh, that Jesus, along with everyone else, got baptized one day. And uh, the, who was officiating the ceremony is completely unimportant to Luke. So everyone has their own version of what happened and why it happened. But in Matthew's version, that's the one we heard today. And in that version, Matthew in, imagines a dialogue between John and Jesus, showing John acknowledging that Jesus is a little more important, special, anointed, got it more together, something, that Jesus is a little bit more. Now this encounter between two apocalyptic prophets that results as Jesus emerging as the greater of the two served to establish some sort of sense of authority in an early movement. Both Jesus and John had followings. They both were itinerant preachers. They were both prophetic, uh, apocalyptic, prophetic kinds of teachers, calling for an end to certain world systems that would be replaced with more godly systems. Uh, John seemed to be a little more militaristic. Uh, Jesus uh, made more room for sort of healing uh, in, in his teaching, but they were both sort of calling for an end to empire that would be replaced by the kingdom of God, the anti-empire of God. And so these two apocalyptic prophets uh, encountering each other and Jesus emerging as the greater, that, you see how that serves the people who were the followers of the Jesus movement uh, as opposed to the followers of John. Uh, the stories that we've inherited from Jesus' followers, that we, we are in that tradition. So you see why we would hear the stories about Jesus being the one that God has raised up above all others. Now, these stories are often used to make a case. These stories of Jesus' baptism are often made to, uh, uh, to make a case for baptism. There are some traditions that insist that it's necessary, that if you want to spend eternity with God, you've got to get you've got to have this ritual. You've got, you've got to be splashed by this water. Now, if you went swimming this morning, that doesn't count. And if you had a shower this morning, that doesn't count. If you washed your face this morning, that doesn't count. And if you shaved this morning, that doesn't count. It has to be this water in this place with these words at this time. And it, it develops this sort of magical quality. And that's not what is going on in the scripture readings today. This imaginative story of the Jewish John baptizing the Jewish Jesus is not a divine directive for the Christian sacrament of baptism as we know it today. Of course, not all Christians observe baptism. The Salvation Army doesn't offer an ordinance of baptism. They have other rituals that are important to them, but they don't offer the ordinance of water baptism. Quakers do not have a baptismal ritual, but believe that real baptism is a life of following the teachings of Jesus, that baptismal living is more important than a baptismal ritual. And the Christian scientists uh, agree. They say that, uh, that baptism for them is daily living, studying scripture and giving evidence by their lives that they are constantly being bathed in spirit. So when we are speaking about baptism, we do need to realize that we don't all have the same experience or understanding of it. That lots of traditions have developed, that lots of rituals have developed, and all of them are probably pretty far removed from what we just heard read from the Gospel of Matthew today. Baptism as a rite of passage, as an affirmation of our place in a spiritual community, as a symbol of divine love with and within us that is never going to let us go, that's a beautiful symbol. And I love performing baptisms. I especially love baptizing little babies because it torments them so, and I get such perverse pleasure out of it. They scrunch up their face and they make noise, and it's just so cute, and I get to lift them up, and everybody applauds, and it's just, you can't go wrong with it. I love baptisms. 
but I, I realize that it's something that we have created. It's for us. It brings joy to us to be reminded that we are all God's children and we are all loved by God and God will never let any of us go. Baptism for me doesn't wash away original sin. With Pelagius, I utterly reject Augustine's notion of original sin. I just don't believe that we are originally sinful. I think we are originally perfect. We are originally wonderful. We are originally part of the creation that God calls very good. We learn uh, to doubt that, and in our doubts, we don't behave as if we are all good, and so we make lots of mistakes, and so the spiritual challenge is to remember who we really are and get back in alignment with that truth and to let the light that is within us shine more brightly, but we are not originally bad. We've just forgotten how good we really are, and our task is to remember a bit more. I reject the idea of original sin, and I also don't believe that baptism is a hazing ritual that allows us into an elite club. Those who, uh, those who are in versus those who are out. Those who get to call themselves the real deal and everyone else are cheap imitations. And I don't believe that baptism is a magical rite that assures us of an enjoyable afterlife once this one reaches its expiration date. There's this uh, a movie I saw once of a missionary priest and with the Europeans and the Native Americans who were on the North American continent, they were always fighting each other, and this missionary priest would go around uh, the, the wounded and, and the mortally wounded bodies of the Native Americans, licking his thumb and baptizing them uh, before they died, or sometimes right afterwards, because that was his idea of trying to get everybody into the club. There's one boat going to the good place, and he was trying to get everybody in the boat, and that's just not my understanding of grace at all. Baptism for me is an experience in consciousness. It is an awareness that we are in God. We are immersed in God. We are washed with God. The, the grace of God is flowing over us all the time. We are in God and God is in us and we are, as Emerson said, part and parcel of God. And we are called to contribute and to share the gifts and talents and passions and skills that we have. In other words, Baptism reminds us that divine light is within us and then calls us to let that light shine. Baptism is more about light than about water. The story of Jesus beginning his ministry with baptism can be seen as an allegory for how all of us can be immersed in a greater awareness of omnipresence knowing ourselves to be children of God and feeling called to share ourselves in creative ways to bless our world. Now this spiritual baptism, this awareness, this, this consciousness of being immersed in the divine presence that can never let us go, this spiritual baptism may or may not be celebrated with a water ritual. It's fine to do so, but it isn't necessary because the ritual is merely an outward sign of the inward event. And it is the inward event, the raising of consciousness, the awareness of God with, in, and expressing through us that is most valuable. A sacrament isn't a magic spell that makes something happen. It is an outward sign of inward grace. And grace is freely bestowed, withheld from no one. It can neither be earned nor lost. Grace just is, like the air we breathe. It is the, aware, it is the presence of God within, within us, never letting us go. It is unmerited favor. It is unconditional love. And it, it is simply the reality that divine life is our life. It flows through us. It expresses as us. It will never, and it can never, abandon us because we are part of it. Now, whether we are talking about the sacrament of baptism or the sacrament of Holy Communion, or whether we are talking about sacramental rites such as marriage or confirmation or praying for the sick, or other actions that connect us to the indwelling gift of divine grace, such as volunteering or financial sharing or even unrestrained laughter. We aren't talking about doing something that makes something happen. We are talking about doing something that reminds us that right where we are, God is. Right where we are, God is, and we are loved by this divine presence throughout eternity. So baptism isn't about how much water we use. There are entire 
denominations that have been split and birthed over the argument of, of how much water it takes and what are the words you should say and, and what is the age of, of the person being baptized. That really, if you're two months old or 12 years old or 92 years old, does it really matter if you use a thimble of water or a swimming pool? Does it really matter if you use these words or those words? Does it really matter? It's not magic. It is a celebration of grace. And the grace was there before we got around to making a party about it. Baptism isn't about how much water we use or the age of the person getting splashed. It's about a divine affirmation of our innate goodness. It's never too soon and it's never too late to celebrate that gift. And however we do it, with a little water, or a lot. It's just a celebration of the goodness that existed long before we got around to acknowledging it. What I think is important in the story, if we wanted to do it the way it's done in the scripture. Now, the Apostle Paul, we read later, he, he is in a bed. He can't see. And when he gets his sight back, he gets up and is baptized as if there was a pitcher of water on his bedside for, for, for drinking. And they just poured it right over him. But in the gospel story of Jesus being baptized, he goes to the river Jordan and is baptized. Well, if we want to do it exactly like the Bible says, if we want to do it exactly like Jesus says, then we will all book passage to the Jordan River. And I can't be bothered. I'm busy. I can't go to the Jordan River every time someone wants to be baptized. But I don't think that's the important part. Here's the important part of Jesus' baptism is the affirmation of his goodness, the divine voice in the story affirming Jesus' sacred value and holy mission. That is what is happening. When we are baptized or when we baptize someone else, we are celebrating the fact that God has always called this person God's own child, and now we are catching up to God. It is the affirmation of divine goodness that matters, and that is what is featured in this story. The Jordan River, it is so incidental in this story, but a big deal is made about this voice. This is my chosen one in whom I am well pleased. And that, that phrase is actually a rendering of Isaiah 42, verse 1. That passage says, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one with whom I am pleased, upon whom I have put my spirit. He shall bring forth justice to the nations. The affirmation of our goodness then calls us to share the goodness to make the world better. That's the point of it all. Now, Hebrew Bible scholars tell us that Isaiah's servant of God image refers either to Israel as it was, or to ideal Israel as the prophets hoped it would become, or to Isaiah himself, or to another prophet at the time. Now remember, prophets speak to their own communities in their own day about issues that they are facing at the time. Prophets are not prognosticators. Prophets are truth tellers, not fortune tellers. And so Isaiah is not prophesying that 700 years later, Jesus will be baptized. Isaiah is talking to his community about something going on at the time. But the gospel writers, writers take that ancient text and apply it to Jesus as if to say that his ministry, like those words from Isaiah, that his ministry was about bringing forth justice to all people, affirming the sacred value of all people, celebrating the promise of God's all-inclusive and unconditional love. Matthew, with his star narrative last week, affirming the sacred value of a peasant child and affirming the sacred value of foreign astrologers from a religion different from Matthew's own, does it again with his story of Jesus' baptism. Jesus is baptized like so many people before him and so many people after. And when that happens, the heavens open up and the divine and the human merge and the sacred is found in the mundane. The transcendent is imminent. Eternity is now and the sacred value of God's child, every one which is God's child, part of God's creation is affirmed. And then following Jesus' baptism, his ministry begins. Baptism is a beginning. Baptism, once we are reminded of our innate goodness, we are then called to put it to use, to put it to work. Baptism is the affirmation that we are the children of God and then the commissioning to go and live as children of God, reminding others that they are the children of God. So following his baptism, Jesus' ministry commences. Baptism is a beginning, a launching pad, a calling forth, a word of encouragement as one is sent out to do something. Bible scholar David Lowe's, who, is, who teaches at a Lutheran seminary in the Midwest, David Lowe says we can only live into the mission that God has set for us to the degree 
that we hear and believe the good news that we too are beloved children of God. Baptism is nothing less than the promise, he says, that we are God's beloved children, that no matter what we may do, God is for us and will not abandon us. In baptism, we are blessed with the promise of God's spirit, God's power, God's presence, God's omniscience and omnipotence and omnipresence. Spirit is that presence. Spirit is that power. Spirit is that life force. Spirit is that breath of God always breathing in and through us. Spirit is the substance of God's life which is the substance of our lives. When the gospel writers imagine the Spirit in some way anointing Jesus and declaring Jesus to be God's own child, we are to know that Spirit also embraces and enfolds and flows through and fills us, and we, therefore, are all God's children, blessed with God's grace, marked as God's own forever. Baptism doesn't make that happen. It is the celebration that it is already true and that it will forever be true. We are loved and our lives are sacred. In 1864, a Unitarian theologian whose writings influenced both Abraham Lincoln and later Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Theodore Parker, published a beautiful prayer. In that prayer, Parker affirms that God is omnipresent. And in that prayer, he affirms that God is part of and in every soul, that God is a presence that is all loving and whose power or spirit or breath is wherever we may choose to look. Parker prayed, O thou eternal one, may I commune with thee and for a moment bathe my soul in thy infinity mother and sire of all that are, in all that is art thou. Being is but by thee, of thee, in thee. Yet far thou reachest forth beyond the scope of space and time or verge of human thought, transcendent God, yet ever imminent in all that is. I flee to thee and seek repose and soothing in my mother's breast. O oh God, I cannot fear, for thou art love, and wheresoe'er I grope, I feel thy breath. That's baptism. The water is a party favor, but the party itself is the experience of God as our very life, the love that will not let us go, the omnipresent power that is always with and within us, the eternal love in which we are forever immersed. Rather than make too much of the baptismal ritual, we should be focused on baptismal living, the transformational experience of being aware that we are immersed in God, forever one with God. If we can embrace, and embody this thought, our lives will be transformed into experiences of abundant and never-ending joy. Our lives will be transformed by the power of indomitable hope. Our lives will be transformed by the awareness that we are in God, and God is in us, and we are God's precious children with whom God is forever well-pleased. And this is the good news. Amen. We don't have a wading pool here today, but I am going to invite you into a baptismal experience, an awareness that we are immersed always in the presence and power of divine love. The divine life is our life, expressing in, through, and as us. I'm going to invite you into that experience of allowing yourself to feel immersed in a universal love that lasts forever. Maybe when you were a child, your parents had that celebrated with some splashing of water. Maybe at a tent revival out in the woods somewhere, you had, as an adult, you had that experience as you were held under in some creek somewhere. And as wonderful as those experiences may have been, they were reminders of an everlasting experience, that we are God's children, we are part and parcel of God, God loves us unconditionally, and God will never let us go. Jesus, according to the tradition, gathered with friends to share a meal in the midst of difficulty. As if to demonstrate that optimism is always available no matter what is going on 
no matter what is happening, no matter how bleak things look. And so gathered with people, he demonstrates that when we gather together, when we share what we have, when we eat a meal, no matter what we are doing, we can experience the presence of God because there's not a spot where God is not. And so Jesus, after that meal, took a piece of leftover bread and blessed it by giving thanks because gratitude is the best way to bless anyone or anything. And then he broke the bread as if to say, when you were feeling broken, remember there is divine wholeness beyond that experience. He said, take and eat and remember. And then he took Elijah's cup and he blessed it and he offered it to everyone, leaving no one out, saying, drink all of this all of you. This is a cup of a new and everlasting covenant, a covenant that includes all people. And whenever you drink this, remember. Holy One, we give thanks that at this table, you are reminding us of our oneness with you and with one another. And so we give thanks for this, and we allow these simple elements, these simple symbols, to remind us of the profound truth that wherever we are, you are, and all is well. Amen. Sunshine Cathedral, we practice an open communion. And what that means is you don't have to be a member of this church or any church to receive the sacrament, just as you are. With whatever your beliefs or doubts may be, you are welcome to participate in this feast of unconditional love. My friends, these are the gifts of God for all the people of God. Hello, I want to thank you for joining us for worship today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. Again, if you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, please stop by and worship with us on Sundays at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to find out more about the Sunshine Cathedral, about our resources, or about our books published by our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Darrell Watkins, or if you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, may God continue to richly bless you on your journey.